Hi there, Martin. It's very nice to speak again. You were saying it's been a couple of years since you first started talking about Christianity, and it was a, a delight to talk with you about it at that stage. But a lot's happened in that time. I mean, a lot happened leading up to that time, but it feels like you're you're running a pace, working out what this all means. Well, yeah, thank you, Mark. I'm very glad to be back here. Me and lots of other people. That's the wonderful thing. It feels like an extraordinary moment without any kind of hubris or hype underneath it. There seems to be a kind of cultural revival of interest in this strange little Middle Eastern mystery religion called Christianity. It's coming from all sides. It's coming from philosophers. It's coming from boat builders, all sorts. So I just feel glad to be part of it. And I think probably the last time we met, I had just experienced a divine liturgy in a, in a Russian Orthodox church. And that's taken me on quite the journey where I went through the uh, sort of chrismation process for about a year and I'm now part of that world uh, and enjoying it with all its contrariness and strangeness. It feeds my mystical heart. But at the same time, mm. mercifully, Christianity is a very broad, it's a very broad tent. And so there's lots of sort of conversations across the hedge with people from all sorts of perspectives. But yeah, super rich. Yeah, well, look, I want to try and unpick some of that because a couple of the things certainly that you've already mentioned there really fascinate me. One is this broad uh, view of Christianity because I'm, I'm not sure that it's always regarded in such a light, actually. And, and I think that one of the things that you have been standing for or feel drawn towards um, is very appealing to me in that respect. So I want to say more about what that might mean, but... Also, I mean, just the, the way you, you phrase it there, this strange little Middle Eastern mystery cult called Christianity, or mystery religion, did you say? Um, but anyway, but I think that, see, that is already to say quite a lot that is quite arresting and startling. Um, even if you are up to your eyeballs in Christianity, you know, like me, sort of have it all around you in your past and present, to not just to make a kind of nod to the history, but to actually be living it as if that is so. That feels to me like a massive difference, actually. And, you know, part of this renewed interest. I mean, maybe maybe one way into into this is I know that fairly recently you were at this um, the Symbolic World Summit um, with Jonathan Paggio, um, who I um, listen to regularly as well, get a lot from. Um, and he had gathered together a group of people, I think, in part to see what it was like when you all gathered and, and and where this might sort of go next almost presumably that is part of this 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 uh revival you're, that you're you're talking about and i mean i wonder very directly actually you know what was that like what 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 was what was the spirit that was moving there to give you an idea of it really one of the greatest moments in the symbolic world conference didn't happen on stage as it rarely does actually on the end of the first night there was a group of monks Orthodox monks gathered on the steps of the venue trying to raise money to build a new church. And they had an Irish fiddle player. They had this table that was filled with moonshine whiskey and enormous cigars. And for a small donation to the church, you could have a little puff or you could have a wee dram and you could just listen to this wonderful music. These are guys in monastic habits. And as I gazed out at this scene and several hundred people putting money down and the whole thing, I thought, you know, I think I've, wait, I've waited forever for a moment like this. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't barroom licentiousness. It was just joy in a very Lewis type of way. It was absolute joy. The whole conference was extraordinary. I was a bit surprised it was in Florida. Now, my association with Florida is almost entirely sort of the mafia and crocodiles. And I thought, well, well, why would I be going to Florida? But actually, I think part of the reason is we were in a little town that was effectively Greek. It was like a Greek outpost. So I think that there would have been probably a, a warmth towards what we were doing, because what made the conference fascinating was that 
it's really a conference for Christians, and often it was Orthodox Christians, but the primary emphasis was not so much on sort of combing over biblical texts. It was this wider symbolic world that Christ is pointing towards. And it was an environment where, and there were plenty of clergy there, you could talk about a fairy tale in the same moment that you're referring to the Genesis story and nobody gets ruffled. That doesn't mean that everybody is seeing the, the life and times of Yeshua as some sort of a series of metaphors. It's not that. But there was a kind of openness that for me was refreshing. I mean, there's about 700 people. Uh, as, as I said, it's this interesting combination of Christians gathered. So as a veteran of that, that was sort of familiar to me. What I'm not familiar with is saying, and for the next hour, we're going to explore a Russian fairy tale. That was dynamic. Uh, I made plenty of new friends. I was reunited with a few old. I mean, I suppose the thing about you would be sensitive to this. If you're dealing with 700 American Orthodox Christians, most of them will have not grown up unless there's they're ethnically, you know, Russian or Ukrainian. They probably furtively in the background, there's maybe a Baptist or an evangelical thing. But for some reason, this longing for a more liturgical contemplative tradition is just re-emerging in full force and so that was the kind of ebullient exciting no one quite knowing what's going to happen next feeling of that conference it feels to me like this desire is to reconnect with roots or the source the wellspring in some way and to approach christianity afresh I mean, this is this is now sort of me speaking in terms of what I try and clear away to to get to some of that, um, you know, moral Christianity, for example, where it feels like the main thrust of certainly what's talked about is, you know, what you're doing and what you're not doing and who's doing this and whatever that that feels deeply unappealing to me. A, a kind of Christianity that's mostly focused on, I don't know, growth and numbers and sustaining congregations and um, that sort of. Where, where you feel that's really the kind of impetus here, who's converting, who's not. And, um, you know, I mean, it, we had to be a bit careful here because, you know, talk of revival can quickly tip in that direction. Um, you know, when people ask, is this culturally significant? They really mean, is it moving beyond a minority? Um, whereas I think what you're talking about, I'm, I'm sure it is, um, it, uh, with cultural significance, is not a sort of quantitative thing, but it's, a, it's something about the quality of the engagement and that is is you know it's what draws me I, i'm working quite a lot on william blake at the minute and i think one of the things that william blake was trying to do for his time a couple of hundred years ago when it, again christianity felt in a kind of malaise maybe not a malaise of the long withdrawing roar but the malaise of just being far too much part of the establishment that he was returning to things like myths and of course he was a great myth discoverer himself myth maker himself and so this business about the fairy tale you know feels very telling to me um because it it's about trying to rediscover the resources and this has been your mainstream long before this latest phase um but about rediscovering the ways of engaging with life um that aren't um rational that aren't moral um but are somehow kind of closely connected to the pulse of things um, and realizing then that in a way you know Christ is everywhere um, which means that in a way you can look anywhere for um, this kind of pulse for, for that which guides and so the stories and the traditions the rituals the gatherings you know it, it does have this much more commodious feel um, which to me feels you know um, deeply attractive um, but that's, I've, I've, I've gone around the houses a bit with that. But I suppose that the heart of it is, is this turning to the fairy tales, say, about trying to reconnect with the source of things um, and feel this pulse that certainly in the wider Western world, but even in lots of forms of Christianity, can get lost. Would that be a fair summary? 
Yeah, I think it would. And for Christians that get hot under the collar, of which I don't meet many actually, about, for example, exploring a fairy tale, I'm with Augustine. I always say this, all truth is God's truth. The stories have these kind of pinpricks of eternity coming through them, and they just do something. Uh, they revive us, they hydrate our ears. The problem is, of course, uh, as I have said before, somehow the message has got confused in Christianity that we are, once a week, we gather and we eat our God on a Sunday, if that's not radical enough. <laughs> you know, that even freaked the pagans out. Um, our God, or Christ, is born a fugitive. He dies an outlaw. He's a scandal from beginning to end. Anybody that comes anywhere near him tends to have some sort of troubling encounter. There's always consequence for getting near Christ. He'll talk to anybody, but then the stakes with which he brings into that conversation is an absolute sort of derailing of probably everything you thought possible up until that moment. So we're dealing with, ironically, kind of countercultural outlaw material. For me, as someone that is, I've had my finger in, I have my, I've had my hand in, in the cookie jar of mythology for 30 years. There's very little I haven't explored, but I had not come across anybody that says the things he says. Now, the architecture of Christ's life, yeah, that's relatively familiar, death and rebirth. We get this through Fraser and Lewis and Tolkien and the rest. But where the rubber really hits the road is what he said. It's what he did. It's easier to project on mystical gods from a long time ago because they don't come with the mission statement of something like the Sermon on the Mount. Um, that's why I avoided him. Christ was too much reality for me. It was too real, this sort of what Jesus was going to do to my imagination. I simply, my legs buckled under the task when I was younger. So I went to lots of other flowers. Now, the thing is, there's many, many thousands of people just like me or you who are looking for a deeper life, who are trying to figure out what actually it means to be a human being, have probably ayahuasca themselves stupid at some point or another. They may know the Tibetan Book of the Dead left, right and centre, but at some point, and maybe midlife is a moment where that tends to happen, it's worth attending to the mythology of your ancestors. And the mythology of the ancestors, for most of us with this pigment, is this strange happening. It's this unruly, peculiar explosion that goes off around Galilee. Um, and there came a point where, as we've discussed in the previous program, it was so formidably present. Christ was so formidably present in my life, not as an exegesis, not as a philosophical conversation at that time, but as an encounter. I, I submitted, you know, reluctantly submitted. So I'm finding as you are and the people, I thought your conversation was really good on this with Rupert Sheldrake, maybe about a year ago where you asked him, you said, just what is going on? And I think Rupert said, he just said, look, people want more than the crustacean of Christianity. They think they know. There's a sensibility that there's something deeper. And actually, despite our disillusion, the conversation between rationality and irrationality doesn't have the hold culturally, I don't think, that it did maybe 15 years ago. And most of us, Maybe lockdown had something to do with it. I don't know. There's a, a, a looking a looking for depth. So that's the, the climate I think I find myself in. It's, it's, it, I think that that shift is, is right. I do sense that. I mean, the way I sense it actually is that I used to have a bit of a habit of introducing myself as a former priest in the Church of England. And that did the work of kind of giving me a bit of sort of cr interest credit um you know like oh maybe he he's going to say something that is a bit you know off off piste um or at least might make me think again um and i feel now um i don't have to say that but what what is interesting though is almost the spirit with which people speak about christianity and i i'm i I'm, 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 I'm very sort of conscious i think that that the words which you use, like referring to Jesus as Yeshua, immediately makes us 
think, oh, now look, something is a bit different that might be said here. I might hear something that does recapture something of the strangeness of it all or the explosion in Galilee or, um, you know, why the Sermon on the Mount um, could actually take me closer to reality, not into some um, sort of moral zone um, that is idealised and so therefore a little bit apart from reality. But it's you, you've got it's got to come from a living place because it's also it's not just the words you use, but it's if it's strange to you, then I think that that will come across when you use words like Christianity, and and you're you're already in a kind of zone where um, you have begun to take off some of that um, those, those that crustacean um, that that blocks things otherwise, but. But for you then, uh, you know, you, you had this sort of this very um, powerful experience that you've talked about um, and we talked about before in the previous conversation. Um, but what's it like two years down the line? Um, I mean, you mentioned the liturgy there and finding a liturgy that somehow can sustain the mystery, sustain the strangeness. I guess that's one important facet. Where do you go to keep the unexpectedness of Christianity alive. I mean, just to throw in one thing that I find useful is, well, one is reading figures like William Blake, who just uh, are, are quite strange um, and just make you think, but you kind of know too they're engaging with something that is deeply serious and connected with the tradition. But also it's things like pilgrimage. I'm, I'm you know, I've done quite a lot with the British Pilgrimage Trust and um, just going on for, going for walks um, to these holy places, um, it doesn't actually take much to make them a, come to you in, in very, very different ways. Um, so th this is in the domain that you're talking about as well, keeping it strange. Yeah, Ab absolutely. For anybody watching that is feeling like, you know, I, I could do with a, <laughs> a bit more electricity in my religious life as a Christian, just try walking a mile in bare feet. Just take your shoes off you'll feel uncomfortable pretty quickly. There may be somewhere near you, there may be a church, there may be a well, there may be a cross, there may be some some place of spiritual significance. It might be a tree, actually. It doesn't have to be a man-made thing at all. But I agree with you. Pilgrimages, when you set out with a humble, straightforward intention, can do miraculous things. Uh, it, it opens up what I think happens to Job at the end of Job, which is your wonder eye. You know, you, 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 you glimpse like Blake, you stop looking at the world, you start beholding the world. And for me, that sense of almost terrifyingly at times, Christ is continually drawing me into more imagination, more reality, more wonder, and sometimes more grief, actually. And and all of that can be held as, you know, as Paul says, we fall into the mind of this thing of which there is no end or bottom. So in January, I would have gone to a small island in Ashir, which is the smallest of the Aran Islands just off Galway, where I spent 10 days seeing very few people, listening, praying, writing, painting a bit, and spending an enormous amount of time at a, an abandoned cell, an old monastic cell of a, a young woman, actually, who was on the run from the mainland. And she arrived there and she was a beekeeper. And by her very presence, her sort of natural saintliness, saints by their nature, people gravitate around them. And she was very comfortable on the island until an angel appeared and said, look, I've got bad news. This actually isn't the place for you. You need to go back. I think it was to County Clare, we'd call it now. And when you see nine white deer, that is the place to start your community. So she travels back over the sea and she starts to walk. And you can imagine every now and then she sees three white deer. And she goes, oh, maybe that's it. Maybe I got it wrong. No, that doesn't work. She continues on. Six white deer, 24 white deer, but finally, the correct amount of these strange white deer. White deer is very significant in mythology. There are always some divine thing leading you on. That's where her community starts. And in Ireland, that happens a lot. Communities, Christian communities are based where there's an encounter with an animal and God is speaking through the animal. So 
that kind of thing is a deep swim out into divine waters for me and it shakes me up it allows things that i keep scurried away by food and repetition that gets broken open however my counter to that is that you want you want to be around people that can welcome you home when you've been out where the buses don't park and i say this with 30 years experience as a wilderness rights of passage guide as a lakota sioux medicine man once told me there's such a thing as too much great spirit you have to be careful that the wonder eye of job doesn't become the blasted eye you know so i am i i know god willing uh for the rest of this year i won't be putting myself through what i just went through on the island it was tremendously rehydrating but now the question i always have and it's always a question for christians really is how do you take a forest epiphany and turn it into a village wisdom joseph campbell always said the role of the community is to torture the mystic to death mm. i don't know if that's true i think it probably depends on the community but we know what he's getting at we know what he's getting at seamus heaney always says and i think this is a christian thing as well we need to make the move from herd to herd like a herd of cows to your capacity to really hear what you know what god is saying one of the things that's very been very real for me in the last two years is this statement you get in the bible my ways are not your ways my ways are not your ways and i i try and hang on to that when i get a little judgmental or you know that phrase a little knowledge is worse than none at all one of the things that can happen is you're doing your reading and you're 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 gradually moving from the encounter which you just said is essential into if you're not careful theories about the encounter and you're a much less compelling character at that moment but it's so easy to do and with that drawing in you start to judge everybody else's fields you know and what's growing in your field and why isn't my field growing at the speed yours is so for me actually the the attention to personal pride the attention to again christ is moving designs within designs within designs that none of us can keep up with that's useful for me because that keeps me in my appropriate size in the universe you know what it's like if you're any kind of public figure inflation is a very real possibility although again my friend james hillman once said to me how are you ever going to get off the ground if you're not slightly inflated so uh you know <laughs> yeah um I, i'm sure you're right about pride and um i mean another thing which i have done a lot i think as well is um sort of hidden behind other figures you know so i i i love talking about dante i've you know written about the divine comedy um it's it's very easy, though, to kind of get into a proxy relationship to Christianity through figures like that. Um, and it's and it's it's subtle because it's genuine. You know, my, the Divine Comedy is a totally astonishing text. And the more you get to know it, the more remarkable it is. But you can get lo lost in a kind of um, a proxy um, encounter through um, the work rather than it tipping you into your own encounter. Again, it's quite quite some um, uh, small things can make a difference. I mean, now, you know, if I do a talk on the Divine Comedy, I invite everyone just to pause for a moment and bring their own intention. Just check out where they're at. What would they really like to learn from Dante, not just learn about Dante, that kind of thing. Um, so once you once you're aware of it, and um, you can address it. Actually, you have to keep then addressing it because old habits die hard. The, the yeah. phrase that also came to my mind as well is um, this phrase about of, of about being in the world but not of the world, and I've, I've 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 I'm increasingly warming to that or holding that in my mind, um, partly because I think another risk is that you contrast Christianity with the world, um, and particularly in an age of culture wars and fear about western civilization or something um it's very easy to sort of weaponize christianity use it as a stick to beat that which you don't like um and before you, you know what's happened 
it's just become a flatland, part of the flatland. It's not bringing anything new in. It's just perpetuating the humdingers that go on. Um, so, you know, I, I, I feel very wary of that. But this phrase about being in the world but not of the world somehow helps me um, because... And, and it's linked to what you were just saying there as well um, about terror, maybe even about torture. Um, I mean, I, I um, have come at this um, side of Christianity more through what would way too easily be called the dark night of the soul. But that really is about um, knowing that everything you trusted, everything you felt you've mastered that was in your control, um, the sense of safety, security even, it can become that which prevents you from falling into the arms of God. The way that that happens is by going through the recognition that these things you know, aren't working for you anymore. They're not delivering what you long for. And so going towards what feels like a kind of darkness and emptiness, it genuinely frightening. And this is why, you know, it's much associated with death and dying, um, because ultimately it is about death and dying. Um, but that can live with you quite vividly um, in the everyday before that actual moment arrives too, of course. Um, but um, taking that side of, of the gospel story seriously, of which, of course, there's a, a huge amount, actually. But, you know, it, it's, it, is, it does ask you all at one level. I hear what you say about yeah. making sure you've got people around to come back from the island as well. Um, but um, going onto the island, yeah, it's, it's got to be part of it. Um, but it's, yeah. um, it, you know, it's, it's asking a lot. Um, I guess people have to, to feel the pull of that rather than um, be recommended or something. But yeah, anyway, you know, this is, this, it's, this is a serious business. Yeah, it is serious. It took me three days to get on the island because the weather was so fierce. Uh, we just couldn't get across on the ferry. Uh, and in the end, I was about to turn back. And actually, uh, a wonderful man called Dara said, look, I figured it out. If you've got the guts to get on it, I'm going to put you on a little plane. And we're going to hit the storm, go through the storm and land on the island. Are you sure you want to do this? And I said, yes, I am. And I got on the plane and there was me, a man called Mihal, and a dog. Sounds like a joke. And Mihal who I will probably never see again, did this really weird thing. He turned to me and he said, on the island in the winter, people get depressed. And the way they deal with their depression is this. They go out and they find the largest rock that they can locate and they pick it up off the ground. And the business of the healing that then takes place is to carry the rock as far as you can without dropping it where you found it and ideally place it on a tree trunk or on a dry stone wall or somewhere where you've slightly lifted it and he said somewhere in the ritual of that process a darkness will leave you and then he said nothing more to me on the plane journey Which is extraordinary and that has stayed with me ever since because if i think if if you are <laughs> really receiving the transmission of what the gospels and christ seems to be about as you say at some point you're going to hit uh some terrifically troubling material the trouble of the bible will never go away for me there are moments of course in the psalms and the song of songs where i feel rested and peaceful and my yearning as the welsh would call it my heroith is in full effect but there are others uh, where I remain a, a deeply wounded person. But now, you see, I have an image for that. I have Jacob wrestling with the angel. There's something I can do with it. On that note, and before I forget, there's a new book out by Rowan Williams called Passions of the Soul, and it is amazingly good. It's a series of lectures. Uh, so there's a kind of oral propulsion in the language, it's a bit like the Gospel of Mark, actually, bang, bang, bang. And for anybody wanting to get clear on the patristic and early Christian idea about how do we live in our in the world, how do we experience our passions, what do we do with them? This is this is a resource, this book. 
um, because I was frightened when I heard Orthodox people saying death to the world. I thought, what the hell are you talking about? What do you mean? Death to the cormorant? Death to the willow tree? Death to the, the jaunty fiddle tune I hear on a Galway evening? No, the world is filled with wonder. But the world also, as we understand, has the fall in it. And it's taken me two years to begin to comb through the notion of being in the world, but not of it, where you can be an engaged, wondrous, compassionate human being, but you're not being run ragged by your impulse system, basically, that there's a degree of emotional literacy about your impulses. That's that's where I've been going. Yeah, I, I've, I've been reading... Um... Brian Williams is Passion of the Soul as well. And uh, I agree, um, it's, it's him when he's at his most sort of, you know, bell ringing clear. And what I loved about it as well is that it made a lot of sense in, in psychotherapeutic terms, um, but it's going um, into a different worldview as well. It's not just, um, uh, you know, being being led by, by your impulses, um, which um, can just keep you trapped in your own psyche and so on well that's definitely part of it uh, but it's it's acknowledging that that um keeps you in relation to a whole um sort of world of of of, of demons and um spirits and so on that uh, are too limiting um I, I that that i found that very compelling too actually um again you've got to be a bit careful how you talk about it but um i think that the idea that it's not just what's going on in our heads, but that we're actually caught in a kind of river or sea of um, impulses and dynamics, entities, forces, and so on. That's part of remaking all this strange again. And what's so brilliant, I think, about figures like Evagrius that Rowan Williams talks about and others is that um, they read now as if they're, they've kind of done all the psychology, they've, they've done the psychotherapeutic training, um, and they've got this much, much larger sense of the world and um, its layers and what's involved in it. But again, another thing that that, that really struck me about the book is um, he's, he's so um, uh, clear, um, not just in terms of explaining, but also clear about, in a kind of conviction sense, um, that if um, you can say to the demon that's approaching you're absolutely right. I am this. I am that. I am frightened. I am. I don't know what to do, uh, and 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 follow that through. Um, then a whole new world is promised, and I, I sort of feel like I need that um, relationship to this deeper tradition, where these great figures, um, you know, present like our own Williams, but also past, ha have 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 been on that journey, have have gone there, because then. Um, that helps me not just reach for the thing which is more of this world and which is a more standard psychological approach, you know, where the thought is, um, you know, just try and help yourself get through the day, have the techniques, the devices um, that enable you to stay in work um, that, uh, you know, mean that maybe you, you feel less troubled. Again, it, it, this is tricky because um, those things are valuable. Um, and we are in this world, but I don't know, I, maybe it's just my time of life again. Um, when you've been through those kind of uh, patterns a, a few times and you've realised that your anxiety kind of stays with you, you, you get more familiar with it, um, but it doesn't really um, fundamentally go. Where, where do you turn to next? And I think the sense that... Um, sort of through the heart of it, um, there might be um, more um, that, that, that can then approach you. Um, and so you're sort of found in this darkness rather than just trying to manage it and handle it for yourself um, with, with, you know, with the help of a few others around you. Um, Ro Ro that, for Rowan me, that's the something... Uh, you know, sorry, say that again. There's something very <laughs> radical about that. that it's, I'm, I'm hesitating and stumbling a bit because it feels almost... Be careful what you pray for, you know, but um, I don't know. Maybe this is part of this moment now as well that, um, well, this is James Silman. He wrote a book, didn't he? You know, 100 years of psychotherapy and the world's no better a place. And so maybe this is part of 
what has been missing, actually. Yes, I I think that Rowan Williams in Passions of the Soul is simply telling a more compelling story. So you can choose how to orientate how you live with the 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 harassments and indignities of every day, the things that come at you, that assail you, the old habits, the bitterness, the miserliness, the illicit lusts, all of that stuff. You can see it all through a psychological lens, which can be life-saving at times. It can be absolutely life-saving. But mythology, which is really what the patristic teachers are drawing on in their fashion, images, that makes it much more dramatic. It makes it um, writ large rather than reducing the heat. You see it on a bigger storied level. And I think that we are storied creatures. I think we're poetic creatures. I think we are ceremony creatures. And I think we go through enormous unnecessary distress when we go through the great divorce from those things. Uh, so I agree with you. I think what I loved about the book is that Rowan also says, you know, not all demons are that smart. They're not all that clever. And so the next time you have to address a demon, which is a great thing, speak at it is to say everything that you say is true but god loves me you know and his love outweighs out poeticizes out everything's this little this little pinprick in my kidneys that you keep aiming at and he also says be careful not to become sort of obsessed by demonology he says the worst thing in the world don't don't give him too much attention have ways of navigating it when they show up. And for me, to see yourself in a world that is full of spiritual adversities and wonder, I think the older we get, the more that makes sense. I'm thinking of WB8 saying that old men should be explorers. Old women should be explorers. We sail to Byzantium. You know, we, we in, in all our befuddlements, it is still... The myths I've been telling for 30 years never begin in a sort of benign, easy, insured, tenured kind of existence. They begin when the stakes are incredibly high and you simply cannot fathom a way out. That's a lot of what is going on at the moment. Wow, my back door has just flown open as I've said that and a storm is beginning. I've got to go and shut the door. So you start talking, I can hear you, I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that, um, you, you know, thanks for putting it like that, by the way, that's uh, um, put it, um, and more usefully um, than perhaps I was. And, and it reminds me actually that um, storytelling is sort of, um, it's a kind of habit of life as well as um, just a bunch of stories that you know. Um, and so um, being able to hold these things in a kind of narrative gives you a lot of freedom, I think, because and this is part of, I think, why myth is so important, actually, that it's ways of talking about things that, that holds together in a certain kind of way, but at the same time, you're always conscious you're talking about more than really you can um, neatly hold together. Um, so again, it, maybe it's another way of sort of being in the world, but not of the world. And yeah. yeah. So th th that's just a, yeah. so uh, thanks for, for clarifying that. Maybe it's also a way of, it, it, the, the terminology is slightly different, but it still works as a Christian. Maybe stories are a way that you refer to the world beyond this world. You know, you're referring to what in myth we would call the other world. But in Mexico, there's a great phrase, the river beneath the river. And logos, not the depth of the Christian experience of the word logos, but logos in a more conventional Greek sense, has a degree of lawyerism to it, reasoning. But the mythos is the place most of us really are longing to get to. And, you know, um, I tried this idea out, by the way, at the symbolic world, and I wasn't thrown out of the building. I said, in the beginning was the mythos. And everybody just kind of went, uh? And I said, look, I'm as much a fan of the Logos as you are. I've read Maximus the Confessor to a degree. I have a sense of the genius and the importance of everything that John is doing. But the mythos really matters. The stories matter. And you just said something important. You said, it's not just about a few stories that you know or you have in po your pocket. It's stories that are really informing and directing 
the patterning of your own life. I'm very interested at the moment in the story of Jonah. I could spend years there and the thought that maybe I made a contract in the belly of the fish to neither be spat out or consumed. I just sat in this limbo. Maybe the fall is now so comfortable to us, we don't even know we're in it yet. Maybe we've created an underworld that is so subtle. As Lewis says, the road to hell will have no signposts. You'll have no idea. No idea. There'll be nobody with a, fitch, with a pitchfork. It'll just be this slow, easy, gentle, cake-filled incline. Um, so I would be so, I, everywhere I'm going at the moment, I, I'll say to folks, look, there's this great treasury of stories, especially the reason I mentioned fairy tales is that you're not going to hit uh, the very contentious ground of cultural appropriation. Not really. So, because what's happened in the advent, in the advent of the internet, you have you have people turning up and saying, well, tonight I'm going to tell a bit of the Upanishads and then tomorrow I'll do Beowulf and then we're going to finish off with a whole bunch of uh, First Nations stories. What could possibly go wrong? Well, right now, a lot could go wrong. However, fairy tales are what I would call a commons of the imagination. No one is getting going to get hot under the collar. There's no village in northern England that's going to freak out if you tell their version of the lindworm. But the... The power impacted in those stories and often the Christian themes that run through them uh, are available to all of us. So a lot of my correspondence in the last two years has been with people raising children. It's been with bishops. It's been with pastors. Anybody who's interested in the process of telling stories, because that is a way you were talking earlier on about how we can use Dante or we can use Blake or we can use, for me, Ted Hughes to slightly hide behind our own direct exposure. And maybe we're modest. Maybe there's things we're attempting to protect or don't feel worthy. But stories are a way, actually, that you can dis close tremendous truth you can say more about yourself by the story you elect to tell in grimms than you can often by by telling me about the last 20 years of your life it's extraordinary um i i think that there's there's something there's, there's a kind of wisdom actually in um being wary of the cultural appropriation too um because um what what it can do is it it can turn your engagement with these things into another form of consumerism, you know, where you, you have a bit of this, you have a bit of that, and um, you get a kind of hit from it. Um, and it may be quite valid too. Um, it, it's genuine insight, you know, these are genuine mystery traditions as well, but quite how it all adds up, um, quite how it's not um, a sort of hiding within it, um, uh, as well as hiding behind it. Um, is, uh, I think, again, probably maybe, maybe it's a real question for our times, you know, when there's a lot of workshops that you can go on that will give you a taster of this. There's a lot of talks online that you can listen to that will give you some insight from that. And, and it's genuine. The, these things, there's a lot of good material out there, actually, I think. Um, but how you're going to absorb that into your own life so that you are living it, not just knowing about it, Maybe there's, you know, there, there is some wisdom, therefore, in trying to return to that which is, um, to use a word that I'll probably get in trouble for, but that is indigenous to these lands um, that you've, 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 you know, been breathing. It's informed your psyche more directly um, in yeah. a way that perhaps you don't even yeah. realise. There would be an old idea in myth and story. Uh, and you would get this, this idea would have been combed through by people like Robert Bly and Richard Raw and others, that the first half of life by nature requires you to have an, various personas that you can put on, various masks that you can put on to, to survive school, jobs, relationships. There's very few people that know all aspects of you, but there's something about the second part of life, midlife, where you want to be moving from 
persona into presence. And I don't want to unpack that too much because that's for everybody to wrestle with. But what would presence feel like in me? What, how would that announce itself? But in, for example, the Grail story, Parsifal, which is an Easter story, so it's good to tell it right now. Parsifal is a young knight who's brought into the presence of an ailing king who's wounded in the groin. And because of instruction by his mother and by a knightly mentor, even though it is clear the knight is desperate, uh, the king is desperate for the knight to ask him about the conditions of his wound, Parsifal says nothing. In the morning, the castle is empty and he sets out aware that some enormous opportunity has just passed him by. And the second half of the story is how to find as an act of will something you were given as an act of grace when you were young. And often, I think for most of us, we do have moments of sort of divine presence in our childhood, but life masticates us, it chews on us, and we have to sort of deliberately set out later in life. Funnily enough, for me, it's running the risk of being ordinary, like I'm just an ordinary Christian. I never say that I'm a, a mystic Christian. I don't, I don't always say that I'm an orthodox cr Christian. Being a Christian is so complicated already that I would be sceptical about adding too much ornamentation to that. And also to do that for me secretly would be a kind of form of aggrandizement or even cowardice. I'm trying to slightly obscure the fact that at the end of the day, I'm a worker bee for Jesus Christ. That's the gig now. The gig now is I am no longer, not all the time at least, some sort of preening opportunist. Uh, I'm actually in the presence of something and I'm just doing that. And that feels fine to me. It feels life-saving. Yeah, I, I like, and I've noticed that, um, uh, you know, you've, you've said a few times that um, you're working not only with Christians, but with people who aren't and um you know the people yeah. who help you at the school of myth and so on uh may or may or may not have precisely the same shared convictions and i think there's a there's a kind of value in that working on that edge too um because um it it it, it keeps you thinking about well if, if you know if you do a lot of speaking it keeps you thinking about the words you're actually using and what you're really trying to say not just slipping into familiar tropes or the kind of phrases that will get an immediate warm response from those who um, are around you. Um, and so there's something about, yeah, that the worker bee um, that's maybe in a, in a hive um, of, I don't know, this metaphor is not going to, I can't push it, but um, you know, the point is to sort of um, keep it, keep it maybe, yeah, this keeping it strange to yourself as well again, so that you, you have to keep um, working out, what it is you're really trying to connect with and what it is you, who it is you're really um, working for um put it like that um is it really um, a worker bee for christ or a, a worker bee for some other kind of group yeah you would be aware of uh do you remember christ uh, i think it's in matthew he talks about you know the sheep and the goats do you remember that little that there's this thing about the sheep and, the, and, the, and one of the points of that really is if you misread it, you may think that good works make a Christian, but they don't. Good works should be a, a response from being in the orbit and the presence and the power of God. Like they're, they're a natural response to it, but they of themselves, and this, you know, puts me in difficult conversations with some of my Christian colleagues. I don't think that's enough. The world is full of civic duty. The world is full of many cultures who have no interest in Christ whatsoever, doing amazing good things. Um, so there's something else that I, th I, th I think is going on. Yet yeah, the School of Myth, we just had a Bible study last night for, for my crew because we're in September. I've I've kind of listened to my conscience, really. And after 21 years of running the school, loving and being so proud of it, I need, there was the beginnings of a kind of slight disconnect between what I was teaching over our five weekend program and actually the edge of my own imaginative thinking and religious life. It was the beginning of a gap. And I can't do that. I can't. 
And so come September, it's a brand new course. It's called The Skin Boat and the Star. And the star in the title, funnily enough, comes from the star, the star of 2000 years ago. Think of all the kind of pomp and ceremony you could drag from Christian imagery to launch a course. But I love the notion of these three shaman, these three shaman who would probably have very little idea if they're Persian, may not even have much idea about the Jewish idea of a Messiah, but they look up at the sky, they're filled with wonder, and they decide to follow. They have the journey, you know, and that's that. the, the uncomplicatedness of that is where I really want to begin in my own work. And so there's no door that you have to go through where you say, I have been a Catholic for four years or I'm leaning towards orthodoxy. All I ask is, a, is, is that your, your wonder is engaged and we go forward. But my team, yeah, most of them, they're, they're what you would call Christian curious, but they, they don't walk around grabbing people saying, have you been washed in the blood of the slain lamb? Mercifully, uh, that won't be happening. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a kind of a shock of that. I mean, last week I just sat there doling out refunds for people that were meant to be coming and are now like, forget about it. So that's sobering, you know, when, when Christ, as he often does, initially at least puts his hand between you and the thing you're secretly worshipping, which is cash or insurance or feeling safe, immediately that happens. But... I'm pleased to say that there, there's a second wind of interest and it'll certainly be running. Well, n let me just add to um, that wind of interest because, uh, you know, looking at the course, which you can find out about online, of course, um, you know, it's, it looks to me to be a tremendous mix of things that you're bringing together. And I love this sense that it's at the, the sort of bleeding edge of your imaginative um, uh, uh, interest now and um, because of course that's yeah. that's a place where there's vitality and life um and it's not just what you're familiar with but what you're not familiar with that you'd be engaging with and drawing on as well so um it, i have no doubt it will be very exciting indeed actually to participate in it, it it's interesting though that the, 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 there is still um there's still a lot about um christianity that can sort of wave you know ring warning bells for people and put people off very dramatically given where you're at now what what do you think what do you think that's about um is it the old familiar associations i don't know to do with the establishment in this country or to do with um the fear of i think it was t.s Eliot who talked about how um you know preachers it's like they always have a kind of design on you and they want to draw you in um, and rather than open something up. Um, I don't know. Is it, are, there, are there new things? What, what, what do you think is causing the, that trouble? Because it, it is interesting. I think, well, I think some of the trouble is absolutely legitimate and just historical. And mercifully, you and I, I don't think you can't come at this with one hand tied behind your back, endlessly apologizing for the machinations of the church for the last 2000 years. You just can't. That's people uh, and the befuddlements. I often say to people when they talk too reverentially about the church being the body of Christ, I say, well, that's all well and good, but the kidneys isn't getting on with the heart and the heart isn't getting on with the brain. And <laughs> there seems to be a massive a general heart attack going on. So, there's that people are aware of that they're aware of uh the catastrophe of the sex abuse scandals amongst clergy in the last 30 years that it from a distance it might look like something that doesn't really care for the feminine doesn't really care for the planet and is primarily the kind of spiritual engine behind empirical pursuit of the last few hundred years so that's a that's a kind of grotesque but relatable picture and what i get what i've had to deal with in the last couple of years is people saying to me great now i presume you will change everything like you're just going to write a news story and we've got you know queer jesus and we've got ayahuasca jesus and we've you know you, you see what i'm saying it's just all of these mm -hmm. things I understand the creative impulse for that, 
but that is absolutely not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the story as was, but told in a way that is imaginative and artful. And quite honestly, in the end, allows the Holy Spirit to do its work. I'm sorry if that sounds like a big tent revival, but that's how I feel. Somebody somebody crunched over a, a, a laptop in Hoxton writing a new version of everything can feel, you know, that that's a wonderful thing. Who knows they're divinely inspired? But no, I mean, orthodox is orthodox. Uh, and I just dis disappoint some of my friends because not all of my views are, are massively progressive. But on the other hand, as I said earlier on in it, I'm very aware of this notion of, you know, Christ saying, listen, your ways are not my ways and that me myself. And so somebody having an epiphany or doing incredible work in some completely other element of the Christian experience, I'm not for wagging the finger at that. I'm not. I'm, you know. No, but I think I, I do um, share that sense as someone who has... I don't know, I even contributed to a book of queer theology at one point. And um, you realise that the queerness has been asked to do a hell of a lot of work, the theology not so much. <laughs> but because because it because it's a kind of tag, it doesn't really go very far either. Once you've made your kind of protest, um, or once if it's the ayahuasca Jesus or the you know mushroom Jesus, whatever, once you've had the trip, and maybe you've had two or three more, where's this really going? Um, and, um, yeah. again, I, I, I kind of hope that just to, to, to pivot slightly more in the psychedelic direction, um, I've no doubt that people are having, um, these experiences looking for a kind of crack in their worldview through which some kind of alternative light might come flooding in. Um, but you've got to realize that it's the light you want, not the crack as it were. So you don't just to have another kind of shattering experience, whether it's a, a dark source or a, you know, a peak source or just something rather banal, actually, which I suspect is what goes on quite a lot of the time, to be honest. Uh, let, you know, we want to go for the real thing, actually, um, and not confuse um, mm. the means with the ends. Um, and so I like mm. very much the sense that you have that that's what you want, actually. You want the spirit. You don't want that which can you know, offer you a, a sort of proxy or a substitute. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I've, I've seen too much for that to be attractive. You know, Leonard Cohen got a lot of leverage out of that line. You know, blessed is the cracks it lets in the light. Like, it, fair dues, but generationally, that has created havoc. And I meet many people that are basically hardwired to associate derangement in their personal life with spiritual growth. You know, it's it's funny, isn't it? People that follow the movement of the moon. I have lots of friends of mine who are always telling me, like grabbing my arm and saying, it's a special moon this month. This month is all about, this is a super, super huge blood red fox moon. And what it's saying is let go of anything that limits you. Let go of anything that makes you attend quietly. Let go of all things that have, uh, you know, nebulous in your past. And there's never a moon, never a moon of like digging down, being prepared to be ordinary, to trade growth for depth. Uh, that kind of moon doesn't seem to exist out there in the petri dish of the new, a lot of the new age world. I, you know, I have to say that with the degree of experience. Um, I'm interested in words like fidelity. I'm interested in the notion of chastity. I'm interested in the notion of gallantry. I'm interested in the notion of earning your name. Christ is anti-kleos. Kleos is an old Greek word meaning imperishable glory. It's what fuels, it's what fuels Homeric myth. I love it. That's why I avoided him, because I wanted tons of imperishable glory. I wanted as much imperishable glory that could rain down on me as possible. So staying with this angular, strange guy that keeps he has Christ has such an ambivalent relationship to towns. He's always slipping off, you know, early in the morning. There's no evidence that he ever had a room of his own. He becomes more compelling the more I'm prepared, as I said, to deal with the interestingly, the notion of reality. Christ for me is was was and probably will always be more reality uh, than I can handle. But as I think Tom Holland has said, 
you know, it is the last mystery left in town. You know, we have think of, of how in the West we've pulverized our way through a facile understanding of Buddhism, facile understanding of Taoism, the peculiar rem rem remnants of New Age witchcraft and the rest of it. I have nothing but love for anybody that's gone down those paths because I think it's all about trying to find out what it means to be a real human being. I have no judgment about it. I really don't. Uh, but I do think, as you and I have been discussing in this last hour or so, it would be interesting to attend to something a little closer to home, maybe a little less glamorous. There comes a point in life where we've tried on a lot of hats, we've tried on lots of funky clothes, and it's like, okay, what is actually the ground that I'm standing upon? You use that word that we're all freaking terrified of using now, indigenous. But one of the reasons I love orthodoxy is because, you know, for one way of looking at it, orthodoxy would have been the indigenous Christianity of this country. You know, um, I've just come back from Wales, actually, last week, and I was in a place called St. Govan's Chapel. Now, St. Govan was a saint who they say was being chased by Irish pirates, and he sort of leapt at a Welsh cliff that then opened beautifully and gathered him in and saved his life. After then, Govan built a little chapel, and you can still visit it to this day. It was his practice. It's the wildest place imaginable. How they did it, I have no idea. Started to hail while I was there. But I love the fact that if we're going to talk about Britain for a minute, you know, I think it was like there are 4,000 roads in this country with, with churches on. And not sorry, forgive me, church, not churches, but crosses on. There's a kind of, you know, a spiritual patterning to the country. Uh, my sister is over in Walsingham, so that's a, a pilgrimage place. And I would encourage anybody to be looking at personal pilgrim places, but also having a few friends. And if you go on a pilgrimage, again, if you're traveling in one direction, see if there's a few people that can meet you at the end, buy you a pint put their arms around you. I know this sounds ridiculously simple and tell you that you are loved because you've probably been deeply moved and you need to be welcomed back in some fashion at the end. Yeah. Um, um, to know where your feet really touch the ground. Um, and, yeah. um, to do, yeah, to do this. I mean, it's, it was very striking to me. I mean, take Blake, um, you know, he's often associated with the weird and wonderful, um, but the weird and wonderful for him is found in the everyday. His his one of his favourite expressions is the minute particulars, and it is um, being able to um, to bring well this this would be incarnation of course, but to bring um, the weight of glory to use Lewis's phrase um, down to that which is immediate. And I, I wonder whether that that is part of of uh, what your experiencing for so directly now and you know you mentioned as well about um you know trying some buddhism trying some taoism and like i've been there um and it was very valuable actually um because it did teach me some basic things like how to be silent which i just couldn't really find anywhere else how to do that um the, the kind of pure skill side of it um so i am grateful but what it did was make me want to return to something that could become a bit more holistic. So it wasn't just sort of bolted on and, but that I could um, practice in principle, at least, you know, every moment of the day and um, the practice of the presence of God, um, this sort of continual prayer um, that becomes, maybe this is a bit like the point about stories. It's not just about learning a few stories, but the storytelling becomes part of who you are um, that you can um, inhabit this world um, and, and not just use it as a salve or um, a, a kind of addition um, that helps you get through the day. Valuable though that is, um, again, like you are, I'm wanting to sort of stress that um, these things you know, really can be lifesavers at times. Um, but maybe now, you know, we, we, we are looking for a moment that wants to move beyond and return to... Um, yeah, that uh, so the air we breathe um, starts to um, tell us of these things, and not just the course that we yeah. go on. Um, but we're beginning to draw to a close, maybe because you, you've also said that you know we've been talking for an hour or so. But I may just want to throw in one more phrase just to see whether it um, it helps just 
go around these things one more time. When I uh, last saw you in the flesh, you were giving a talk with the Temenos Academy, and which, in parenthesis, um, for me is a, a tremendous source of um, people, but also, um, you know, real knowledge about these things um, and very, very valuable. Um, but nonetheless, you you framed your talk there a bit in terms of the idea of romanticism coming of age. And, and this has been a phrase that's very interested me because um, my um, favourite person amongst the Inklings wasn't actually Tolkien or Lewis, but was Barfield. And Owen Barfield wrote this book called Romanticism Come of Age. And um, he goes in a particular direction with that, um, that I must say I uh, struggle with, um, which is he felt that Rudolf Steiner was really talking about romanticism come of age. And, and um, I get some of that regular listeners to me will realise that I, I come across Steiner and then start to stumble. Um, but um, I think that the, the, the bigger impulse you were onto as well, which is how can that which maybe is a beautiful experience, maybe is a very evocative turn of phrase, maybe is a deep lament for something lost. How can we move beyond that? So this romanticism doesn't just console us, but actually takes us somewhere. And that's both in relation, I think, to um, the big questions like our ontology, our theology, you know, what um, are we actually really going to bank on? What bet are we really going to make um, with the big stories we might be able to tell about the world and the way it is? Um, but also at the same time, it is um, that which is most immediate. So it can become part and parcel of an everyday life, as you say, can become ordinary too. I, I, I sense that that's something about what a romanticism's come of age might be like. And I, I mean, it'd be wonderful to think that something like that was beginning to unfold in our times. Brilliant. Beautiful, beautiful riff there, Mark. Thank you. Yes. And of course, that was I was working overtly from that Barfield notion. But like you, uh, Steiner, Steiner will never be my guy. He just isn't. He is for many of my friends, but he's not for me. Uh, but the notion of a romanticism come of age, a romanticism that doesn't peter out like Kurt Cobain at 27 or Jim Morrison, something that has epic later stages in it, uh, a romanticism that has been to the underworld and returned with a gift, which is a very mythic way of looking at it. Lorca writes beautifully about it in his notions of the word duende. Well, how do we, where, what do we do with that? How do we turn, you know, groovy, deep, teary feelings into something that you can actually hang your soul on? Well, you know, I'm going to be very predictable now, and I'm going to go back to that moment in Athens where Paul walks into the temple, you know, he's with the Athenians, uh, or and he says, look, wasn't that interesting? Look over there. You have a statue for the unknown God. And I'm now going to tell you about that God. I'm going to bring into an extraordinary kind of focus something that has just lived as a myth or as a rumor or as an impulse. And um, that for me is a lifelong unrepentant romantic absolutely a romantic that's what i'm i'm wired as christianity for me even when it's very stark which can seem like a non-romantic quality the starkness of christ can feel unromantic where it where it takes us and this is to do a lot with you know lewis's work on longing and this word heraeth and in greek myth it would be nostos it's this longing for something that is home but is beyond a human home really uh, that finds itself for me in in Christianity and in Christ. So I'm very interested in the moment at the 12th century and the arrival, the arrival of the Romantics later on, the notion of the chivalric code, because I realize actually, especially I think for for young men, a notion like you, I'm I'm kind of allergic to Christianity as a kind of clearly enforced morality. That's not what I'm getting at. But there is something about a, lo a longing to know how to sort of orientate and get your house in order to a degree, no matter what that looks like for something else. And that's a lot of what Christianity is doing for me. There are endless number of decisions. So for 50 years, I worship at the Temple of the Unknown God. I am a romantic. Now, that's all well and good. But whenever I had to make a furtive or shifty little decision, 
I could just kind of turn away from that thing and no one knew about it and it wasn't a problem. The problem that I have now is that I am daily, hourly accountable. And that means I have to be more predictable. As Rowan says in the book that we both love, be careful of admiring your complexity too much. Be careful of patting yourself on the shoulder. Well, aren't I? I'm too complex for Christianity. My my thoughts are too big for Christianity. Well, you know, I don't buy that for a second. You're just dealing, if that's what you think, you're dealing with a facsimile of that reality. It hasn't hit you yet. Yeah. No, I think that um, when you were talking there, it reminded me, it feels like one of the things that gets talked a lot about um, as well is 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 limits and limitations and constraining and 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 um, you know not um, sort of running away with um, the excesses that are so evident around us and there's clearly something in that but um, it, it makes I always want to say yes but the reason why I think um, Christianity suggests less is because actually that's the path to more um, that it, it's when you say no to that which is um, you know, maybe familiar, maybe easy, maybe readily available, um, part of this world, um, then that is putting you in a place where something much more might come through. I love Blake on this. He talks about, um, um, you know, more and more is the cry of a mistaken soul. Um, that's the sort of consumptive impulse. But he doesn't say, therefore, make do with less. He says, no, nothing less than all will satisfy man. And that's something about this this promise, I think, you're touching on. You, you, I've been reading a bit of Ursula Le Guin um, with her work on myth recently, and she talks about this famous phrase, I think, I'm, it's all new to me, but um, a, a sort of a, um, a, a greater belonging and a vaster identification. Um, and that uh, finding um, these ways, following the energy, this is another thing that I think Barfield gets at, actually, is that, um, you know, when you read a poem or you're going on a walk, don't ask too quickly what it means or what it's referring to or sort of pin it down with your reason. Just follow the energy, stay with the energy. I think that's why he got led to Rudolf Steiner, actually, is that this energy kind of came to him through Steiner's work. And so he had to follow that. And um, so, yeah, identifying where the energy is coming to you and, and allowing that to seep into you. And um, I think yeah. using the mind too, my, but mine may be more for discerning and, asking yourself, you know, am I following this, uh, this lodestar um, as well as I might do, um, rather than trying to well, sort of package it up too quickly? Yes. Well, look, on the notion of, of lodestars, I will now, if you don't mind, have an absolutely unapologetic plug for this course, because I'm delighted that you'll be joining me on the second weekend. And so if anybody is interested in what we're talking about, we're setting sail in September, the skin boat and the star. It's five weekends from September to March. It's in real time, predominantly. It's down on the very edge of Dartmoor in this wild old kind of Agatha Christie house. It's the kind of house where someone gets murdered, but God willing, that's not part of the uh, program. And we begin in antiquity. We begin at the beginning of things and we make our way through various weekends either go to the school of myth.com and look on courses and it'll be up there or my own substack the house of beasts and vines which is that's where the the most burning issues for me in my christian thinking that i'm having to come to terms now oh you're becoming a christian thinker in your own way you know that's never an idea that would have happened to me but it would be there too we've got We've got your good self coming along with Rowan Williams is coming. Ian McGilchrist will be talking to me, a woman called Frederica Matthews Green, who's going to be coming and looking at Mary, um, Jonathan Peugeot, the wonderful um, Malcolm Geit, Reverend Helen Orr. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary package with a, a variety of voices, and I will be attempting to steer us from one end to the other. So uh, I hope some of us will see us there yeah look martin i'm so glad that you are pursuing these things with all the energy and um that desire um that which which comes across you know when 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 you speak and but bringing you know it's, it's great that you're you found so well how to bring together all that you've been doing before 
um, into this new phase um, yeah. with Christianity. That is so encouraging to me. So look, thanks for talking. Um, really good to do so. I look forward to speaking again soon.